Good morning. Merry Christmas. Uh, so glad that you're here today. Um, one thing, as you leave today, we want to be a, among the first to give you a gift. There's a little booklet that's up here on the front tables. There's also a table out in the foyer. You can pick one up on your way out. It's a little booklet. It's a devotional called The Hope uh, of Christmas. And the amazing thing about the books, I have to give you this disclaimer, or maybe it's a claimer, uh, is that we bought them to give last year for Christmas. Uh, but we went a different direction last Christmas. And so as I was preparing my message, uh, Michelle remembered we had these booklets, and so she, she brought them out and asked if we'd want to give them this year. And I have a very non-traditional uh, text today, and it's printed on the inside left of the folder. I already had the message. Uh, and so we had this booklet that we chose last year to give away that just so happens to have this very non-traditional uh, passage printed on the inside left cover. So it's pretty cool. That I don't know if it means anything to you, but it's, it was pretty cool to me when God said, yeah, I, I had that for this year, not last year. So pretty cool. So we're going to pray and just ask that God would speak to our hearts today. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for this time of year, Lord, where we choose to remember. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to walk in that remembrance every day. But Lord, I pray in a special way, help us to remember today that God so loved the world that he gave. Uh, Lord, that you sent your son, Lord, as a baby, Lord, to live, to die, to pay the price for us. And so, Lord, we just say thank you for that. We ask that you'd speak to our hearts and speak to us through this message. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we talked about a blue Christmas, and we recognize that this time of year can be very difficult uh, for many in our culture, for many in our church family, and for many in our, in our families. Um, it's not so bright and cheery, but actually can be quite sad. So we recognize that uh, last week, certainly still recognize that this week. But if you're in that type of situation, one of the things that we talked about last week is just encouraging you to remember that you share something in common with Christ then. Because the very first Christmas would not have been bright and cheery, but rather pretty bleak uh, leading up to Christmas. Uh, there, was a, there was a moment, there was a time that it became pretty bright uh, when the angels appeared. But you have something in common with them. And so if you missed that message, I encourage you to go back and listen to that or watch that. Uh, this week I want to talk about bright Christmas. So we went from blue to now bright. And what is it about Christmas that can bring light and that can bring brightness into our lives? Luke chapter 2 verse 10 says, but the angel reassured them saying, don't be afraid for I've come to bring you good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard, and it is for everyone everywhere. Everyone everywhere. So if Christ coming at Christmas isn't the best news that you've ever heard, you've misunderstood why he came. All right? Because if you understand that God is coming to earth as a baby because he wants a relationship with you, because that which has held you back from a relationship with Christ, he wants to redeem that. He wants to take care of that because he loves you that much. Like if you don't know that, then you don't understand. This is the greatest news that anyone has ever heard anywhere, and it's for everyone, everywhere. Now, why is the, his advent, uh, his coming at Christmas, why is it good news? Uh, part of the reason of that is because of the gifts that he brought with him. And we're going to talk about that as we get a little farther. But in this passage, it tells us who the gifts were for. And I want you to say this with me. Everyone, everyone. everywhere. Turn to your neighbor, put your finger in their face, and say, everyone. Turn to your other neighbor and say, everywhere. All right? So whatever classification of person or people that you would like to say, it's not for them. God's saying it's for everyone, everywhere. There's no gap. There's no person. There's no group of people that this news is not for, that these gifts were not for. It is for men and for women. That means there's no gender, uh, there's no gender discrepancy. It is for boys and for girls and for men and for women and for adults. It's, there's no age discrep discrepancy. It is for red, for yellow, for black, brown, and white. There's no race discrepancy. It is for the rich. And it is for the poor and for everyone in between. So there is no economic discrepancy. It is for good people and it is for bad people. And all the bad people said, Amen. all right, Amen. All right, that should be all of us. So some of you think you're really good. So it is for good people and for bad people, which means there's no behavioral discrepancy. 
And it's not just for people who believe the right thing. Uh, that means there's no religious discrepancy. This news was for everyone and everywhere. So Jesus came to bring great joy to all of us. Now, how many of you know that is great news? Like, it's not mediocre news. It's not just okay news. Uh, this is great news. Uh, now, do you know what great news does in your heart? Well, let me ask it this way. Do you, have you ever had tragic news? Like, just horrible news. Something really, really bad happened in your life at some point. And you can think back to, like, what that did in your heart. Can I promise you, if it was horrible news, one of the things that it did in your heart is it crushed your hope, right? It, it damaged your hope in that moment, it, either your hope for that relationship or your hope that you had for that life or the, your hope that you had, whatever. It kind of crushes your hope. So what does great news do in your life? It gives birth to hope, right? When you, get, when you get great news, and think about just in the natural, when you've gotten great news before, what it did. Like she said, yes. Right? I don't know about for you, but in my life, that was great news. Like, I don't know if she's going to say yes or not. Uh, we had talked about it a long time, so I really knew she was going to say yes. But still, it was great news when she said yes. Or, like, it's a healthy baby boy or girl. Right? That was great news. Or, you got the job. Or, how about the cancer is gone? Right? That's great news. When you receive great news, it produces great hope. Now, hope is a word that is among, I think, one of the most misunderstood words in the English language. We butcher the word hope, uh, especially when it comes to biblical hope and what that means. First, I think we need to understand what hope is not. Uh, some examples of what biblical hope is not is something like, I hope the Packers uh, get their act together next year. All right? Anybody, first of all, anybody agree with that statement, right? We, we hope that, Yes. Uh, or I hope we get snow on Christmas. Uh, or I hope I get what I want for Christmas. Uh, I hope I get good grades this semester. Uh, I hope the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, okay? I know it's not good for, hey, here's, here's the deal. All right. I have rooted for the Packers for the last seven years. All right. Even though I'm a Chiefs fan, first, I root for the Packers. All of your, if you're a Packer fan, your season's done, all right? So you got to transfer allegiance to somebody for the playoffs. Could I just invite you to the Chiefs bandwagon just for, just for this year, okay? Free of charge. I like it, all right. But that type of hope, it shows like the desires or the concerns in our heart. Uh, it's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with that kind of hope. But it lacks something. And what it lacks is certainty. You could replace hope in those examples with the word wish or the word want. Like I wish this would happen or I want that to happen. And it's, it just has no structure to it. It has no strength to it. Uh, so think about this. It's kind of like, do you remember bubbles? Like you took the wand and you like blew them around. You had like little bubbles coming in and stuff. Like. Oh, like that. Yeah, that's just like that. So when you have these bubbles, you're like, oh, I'm going to catch one. Boop. And you try, you know, if, if you just somehow, that's like the way that this is defined as hope is like it has no structure. It's just a wish. It's whimsical. It's just something that you wish. You hope. That's the way that we use that word. We just hope, fingers crossed, that this could happen. They look beautiful to the eyes, but they disappear at the slightest touch. See, that kind of hope is something that we want to happen, but we have no way of knowing that it will happen. So we keep our fingers crossed and we just hope that these things will go our way. See, biblical hope is not wanting or wishing. It's actually trusting and it's confident like that kind, you don't have any confidence that you're going to be able to catch any of those. It's just, I'm hoping this can happen. I'm wishing, I'm wanting this to happen. Biblical hope is like, I know, right? Biblical hope is not wanting or wishing. It's trusting and it's confident. Now, if people say like, I hope the Packers win, what they're really saying is I want them to win. I wish they would win because I don't want to have to face the Bears fan in my cubicle, 
Uh, so I really wish that they would win. Uh, I want them to, but it is just that. It's a wish. On the other hand, if someone says, I hope in God's promises, they're not like wanting or wishing, right? If they say, I hope in God's promises, what they're saying is, I know God keeps his promises. Like, I know that, and I'm going to walk in trust while I'm waiting for them to be fulfilled. That's a whole different ballgame. I'm not wanting or wishing No, I'm walking confidently and trusting that he's going to keep his word. If if he made the promise, I believe that, I trust that, and I'm going to keep walking believing that while I'm waiting for it to be fulfilled. Do you see the difference? Like that has structure to it. There's confident steps that you can take on that. That That's a cornerstone of Christ. Now, let me read our text for today. Romans 15, 12 and 13 uh, says this. And, and Paul, who wrote Romans, he's, he's looking backwards at one of the prophets in the Old Testament uh, because he's talking about this is something that he talked about 800 years ago. Now it's coming to fruition now. And so he says, Isaiah said, the heir to David's throne will come and he will rule over the Gentiles. Like all the Jews knew that these were, these were verses that were talking about the coming Messiah. And he says, they will place their hope on him. And then he jumps into a prayer and he says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope. That doesn't sound like confident wishing, confident wanting. No, confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now what I understand When I understand what hope is, my Christmas can actually move from blue to bright. When I understand what real hope is, it's something I can build on and stand on. Because biblical hope turns off the dark by turning on the light. Now look how the message translates verse 16. It says, there's the root of our ancestor Jesse breaking through the earth and growing tree tall, tall enough for everyone everywhere to see and take hope. When the people of the first century, when they read this letter that Paul wrote, uh, and they read these words, we have to go, what what did they hear? Like when they're reading it in that context uh, during their day and age, what what did they hear? When they, they, there's the root of our ancestor Jesse breaking through, what did they hear? And I think what they heard uh, was the words of Isaiah, right? They, They remembered uh, when their mom or dad or a rabbi had talked about the coming Messiah and what he, would, what he would do and where he would be from, and they remembered. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, out of the stump of David's family, right? It's pointing back to Jesse's lineage. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Verse 10, in that day the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. So when they heard this passage in Isaiah applied to Jesus, I think they thought God keeps his promise, right? Throughout this passage in Isaiah is he will. Like this is coming. This this is going to happen someday. And so when they're seeing it fulfilled in their day, they go, God kept his promise. And I can assure you, God keeps his promises. So the words of the prophet Isaiah that were written 800 years before Jesus was born found their fulfillment in a baby born in a manger. The heir to David's throne will come and now has come. They will place their hope on him and now they do place their hope on him. See, our hope was sent from heaven. In fact, here's what I want you to remember from this message. Jesus came not just to bring hope, but to be hope. See, there's a difference between those. He didn't just come bearing gifts. He came as the gift. He didn't come just to bring hope. He came to be hope. I love how the Passion Translation puts verse 13. I love this. Now may God, the inspiration and fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and perfect peace. 
How many of you would like overflowing joy or perfect peace right now? Right? Those are pretty good gifts. And here what is the key to receiving those gifts. Do you remember earlier that who the gift was for? Everyone, everywhere. So we, the gift is for us. But there's a key in here that tells us, like, you've had this gift. Right? This gift has been waiting for you under the tree since the day you were born. This gift is for you. You are a part of everyone, everywhere. But the key here is whether or not you've opened that gift. Now, this gift has been waiting under the tree, but it's not been a Christmas tree. It's been the Christ tree, the cross, right? It's waiting there for you and for me. And the only way that we open it is told right here, as you trust. When you place your trust in Christ, as you trust in him, you receive the gifts that are inside that trust. And inside that trust is overflowing joy, overwhelming joy, is perfect peace. All those things are inside of that gift. So it says, as you trust him, as you trust in him, you're opening, you take off the bow and you open the lid and inside are those things inside that relationship. And he continues, and may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his superabundance. I like that how he ends this, until you radiate with hope. Have you ever met somebody that just, you, you were in their presence and you just, you just felt hope because they felt hope and they just radiated that. You could just see that. Man, I don't know about you, I wanna be. That's what I wanna be like when I grow up. Uh, I wanna radiate with hope. Now I want to spend just a little time digging into this verse uh, and this prayer that Paul is praying over us. See, true hope has its inspiration and its fountain, uh, its source is all in God. Uh, The things that we discover in a relationship with Christ have a foundation. It's in God. It's not a theory. It's not a philosophy. That kind of hope is a person, and his name is Jesus. Uh, we don't have to work up that kind of hope in our own strength, crossing our fingers, I, I hope, I hope. No, he is the hope. We stand in him. Uh, that kind of hope comes from God. Psalm 130 verse 7 says, Hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. So let God pour his hope into your life. Uh, Peter calls this overflow of hope. He has a different term for it. He calls it our living hope. And I want you to look where that living hope comes from. 1 Peter 1, 3. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Through the resurrection of Christ, we receive an overflow of hope, a living hope. Now, what does it mean for hope to be alive? Now, when I read that and I was thinking about it uh, and I was thinking about what hope does in our life and what the lack of hope does in our life, uh, you know, when we receive great news or horrible news, when I was thinking about all this in that context, I thought it reminds me of the cross, living hope. It reminds me of the cross because think about it. When Jesus died on the cross, it was the worst possible news. And so when Jesus died, What died with him for those who followed him? Hope. No hope. Look at the disciples for the three days that he was dead in the grave. They weren't, there was no joy, right? They experienced no peace because their Savior had died. And with him, hope had died. But look what happened when he rose from the dead three days later. Look what happened to them. What happened to them? They didn't go, oh, that's cool. Like hope, I mean, they, they had life again. They had joy. I mean, you, you experience them after the resurrection, there's incredible joy. There is boldness and bravery and courage. Why? Because hope had been birthed again. Like they, they renewed, it was a living hope. And they never had to be hopeless again because why? Because Jesus is hope and he was alive. And as long as he was alive, there was always hope. There was no hopelessness anymore because their hope was alive. It was the best possible news. He was alive. And so now we have a living hope because Jesus is alive. So no matter what your circumstances are this Christmas, hope is alive 
because Jesus is alive. Jesus came not just to bring hope, but to be hope. Now back to our text, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So when God gives us hope, he gives us himself because he is the fountain. He is the source of hope. So our, our hope is not in vain. It's not an empty hope. It's not wishful or wistful thinking that's fragile like our bubble earlier. Our hope is an absolute confidence. Our hope has a foundation, which is a cornerstone to build our life on. It's not something that we add to our life. It's something we build our life on. Our hope is an assurance based on who God is. So our, our hope is a person, and his name is Jesus. I want us to look at the incredible gifts now that, that God pours out in our life as we trust in him. These gifts, because of Christmas, are better than any other gift of Christmas that we've ever received. Number one, we can have joy as we trust in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So we can have joy. I think this points back as well to Luke chapter 2, verse 10. I bring you good news that will bring mediocre joy. I bring you good news that will bring eh, joy. No, I bring you good news that will bring what? Great joy to all people. So what is the good news that brings great joy to all people? The verse continues. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, has been born. There's your hope. Your hope is born in that crib right there, in the manger right there. That's where hope, hope has been born there. Today, this day, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born, hope has been born in Bethlehem, the city of David. The good news that brought joy was that hope was born. So Jesus came not just to bring hope, but to be hope. And so we can have joy this Christmas when we place our trust in him. You know, because one of the reasons, one of the main reasons he came is so that we could know that we are right with God. So we can know that our sins, though they are many, I can't speak for you, I can speak for me. My sins are many. My sins are enough that they would keep me out of, a, out of heaven. How about you? Now what I know is true, whether you know it's true, what I know is true is your sins would also keep you from heaven. All of us. So what joy can we experience this Christmas season is knowing that our sins are forgiven. Like that's the, the source of joy is when our sins are forgiven. Psalm 32, one and two says, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven whose sin is put out of sight. Like, that's some good news right there. My debt is clear, right? What joy for those whose record, anybody have a record? I'm not talking about with the courts. I almost got you to admit that, no? That's not what I'm talking about. How many of you have a record in heaven? Like, he knows, he knows my innermost thoughts and he knows the, the things I should have done that I didn't do, he knows every single thing about you and every single thing about me. What joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared. Like what an amazing word that is. If you think about that, you have this long record. Maybe it's been written on a whiteboard and it just fills up row after row after row. And because you've placed your trust in Christ, one big swipe, whoosh, your record has been cleared as if you've never sinned. I mean, you know, that's great news. Like, that's incredible news. What joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt. See, he is our great news, which will give us joy. Our sins can be forgiven. He is our hope. The second gift that's included in that verse, we can have peace. As we trust in Christ. You can't have peace if you trust in your own good works to get to heaven. You can't have peace if you trust in someone else. You can't have peace if you 
if you place your trust in any other thing, the only time that you can have peace is as you trust in Him. When you place your trust completely in Christ, you can have peace. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust. Another way to say that is all who hope. That's how solid the word hope is, biblical hope. All who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Peter, in preaching a sermon that, that Luke recorded in Acts chapter 10, says, this is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Like it's not through your good works, it's not through your sacrifices, it's not through keeping of the law, it's not keep through any of that. The reason the law was given, we're told in another place, is to show that we couldn't do that. You can't have peace with God just through keeping the rules, right? The only way you can have peace with God is through Christ, who is Lord of all. Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, right? That's by placing our trust in him by faith. When we do that, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And lastly, Jesus speaking in John chapter 14, verse 27 says, I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace. Peace of heart and mind. And the peace that I give is a gift the world cannot give. I want you to understand if you're in here this morning and maybe you're visiting family and maybe you just decided to join us for this weekend and you don't have that peace, you don't have that relationship with Christ, can I, I want to just encourage you with that. Maybe you've tried to find everybody wants peace. Never met anybody in my life that did not want peace. I've met some people that didn't act like they wanted peace, but everybody wants peace peace. We want to have that peace in our life. And, and too often times we've, we've searched for that peace in other things. Uh, we've searched for it in prescriptions. We've sort, searched for it in relationships. Uh, we've searched for it in the bottle or we've searched for it in any other thing. And Jesus literally, the Son of God speaking to you and to me today, said, the world cannot they have nothing to offer where they can give you the gift of peace. Peace in your heart, peace in your mind. He said, that's the kind of gift that I give. So how can you experience joy and peace this Christmas? It's to open the gift. Those gifts come as we trust in Him. Jesus came not just to bring hope. He came to be our hope. So the baby that was born over 2,000 years ago in a faraway place came to die as a sacrifice and to take our place. So when we place our hope and trust in him, we can experience joy and peace within. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. See, here's the question is, have you opened that gift? See, the way that we open that is through placing our trust in Christ. And when we do that, when we place our trust in Christ, that is when we can experience joy. That's when we can experience peace. And so I just wanna pray a prayer this morning. And I'll tell you this, it won't do anything for you. It will just be words recited unless you mean it, if you trust, if you pray it in faith, if you pray it with trust, if you pray it that way and you take that step of faith, I believe with all my heart that Jesus meets us right there and we can receive those gifts. Can everyone all together, would you pray this prayer with me this morning? Dear Jesus, I confess that I, I have sinned. I confess I do not have peace. 
Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. And thank you for rising from the dead and giving birth to hope. Forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new from the inside out. Help me to fully trust you in every area of my life. Thank you for the promise that as I trust you, I will experience joy and peace. I give you the praise in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a clap offering of praise this morning? For anyone who prayed that prayer this morning, the minute. Now, ushers, you may begin to serve the elements. We're gonna receive communion. And man, if you just if you just prayed that prayer, this will be the coolest first communion ever. That you actually remember. You're you actually get to participate right away in receiving of these elements. But if you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you to text the word next to the number on the screen. And when you do that, you're gonna receive a link to three short videos that we put together that we just believe will help you to know what are the next steps that you can take to grow in your new faith. I wanna encourage you to do that. Now this morning, I can't think of a better way to close the service than, than to recognize and remember the sacrifice of Christ that was put into motion when he came as a baby, when hope was born. You know, last week I used this quote that I found that just simply says, if you don't see the shadow of the cross falling across the manger, then we don't understand correctly. And so when we look on the manger, we actually need to remember he came for the cross. Like he came for that he, because he came for you, he came for us powerful thought when we remember that. And so we're going to sing, Come Let Us Adore Him, and then I'll come back with some closing comments and we'll receive communion together.